Hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast today. And today we have a guest calling in from California, and um, she is an American journalist, and she has developed a very interesting way of teaching kids in school and so forth. And she's getting a lot of notoriety for what she's done with this teaching process. I want to welcome Esther Wojcicki to the Unimpressed Podcast. How are you doing, Esther? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. And you did a great job saying my name. I guess you, you're in California? I'm at Stanford University. I'm like right on the campus right this minute. Okay. And tell me a little bit about your your passion and, and what brought you to this point in your life uh, with this initiative of, of teaching, this different initiative of teaching. What led you down this path? Well, first of all, I'd just tell you that my passion is to empower students, to give them a voice and to give them the skills that come with actually doing something. So I have this acronym that is called TRIC, and um, it's in my book, How to Raise Successful People. And TRIC stands for Trust, Respect, Independence, Collaboration, and Kindness. And I say it belongs in all classrooms. Teachers should give students more trust and more respect, listen to their ideas, give them as much independence as possible, collaborate instead of dictating, and treat them with kindness all the time. And this results in the skills that are for the 20 first century. They're called the four C's, communication skills, collaboration skills, critical thinking skills, and creativity. That's what we want all kids to come out with. And unfortunately, when you sit in a classroom and don't talk to anybody else and listen all the time to the teacher, number one thing happens after 15 minutes is your mind sort of drifts and uh, you aren't paying attention and you actually don't learn very much at all. You're probably dreaming about what you're going to do on Saturday night or what you're going to do as soon as you get out of this class. And Mm -hmm. um, active participation is the way to learn. Actually doing something is the way to learn. I mean, I could just ask you, you know, uh, did you learn to ride a bicycle by reading a book about it? I did not. (laughs) Or how about swimming? Did you watch the Olympics and then jump in the pool and do the same thing? I did not. (laughs) <laughs> well, I don't think anybody does. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's one of the problems. The school system expects us to be able to do all these things by just talking about it mm-hmm. and not doing it. And so um, my method is uh, I teach journalism. And with those skills that students develop when they're journalists, they're basically skills for the 21st century. Mm-hmm. It's like how to gather information, how to sift out what's important from what is not important, how to write it up in a way that somebody else wants to read it, not some poor teacher that's paid to read it. Then also how to publish, you know, the skills for either making a video or creating a newsletter or a blog or something else like that. And then nobody does this alone. You need to do it with a group. So how to get along with other people that are all trying to do something, you know, a common goal, publishing a newspaper or creating some kind of science project or, you know, it has to be something that's a group project. It can't be something that you do just by yourself where you don't develop collaboration skills. And let me uh, ask you this. I mean, is you know, I, I talk about kids when they start school, they lose their imagination. Was this a thread of information to kind of adjust your thinking on how to teach some of these classes? Because I think kids lose their, lose their imagination completely after they start school. Yep, you know, they come completely. into school. Actually, the statistics show 95% of kids are creative in kindergarten. By the time they reach 12th grade, only 5% are creative. That's because mm-hmm. they've all learned to follow the rules mm-hmm. and they're afraid to step out of the rules. Because if you step out of the rules and you don't answer the question the way the teacher expects, you get a bad grade. Mm -hmm. So we're training like everybody, generations of kids around the world to just follow the rules. So on the one hand, I do think we need to follow the rules to some degree. You know, we don't want to have chaos in society, but but maybe not 100% of the time. Could we have mm-hmm. step back and maybe give kids an opportunity to think that they can do something independent and creative by just giving them maybe 20% of the time to be creative and the other 80% can be the old traditional system? So that's what I've been you know, trying to do. I mean, you've got a formal outline of this process. Does this somewhat come from a, a, a spiritual foundation, if you will? So I'll tell you where it came from. So I am the child of immigrants. My father was from the Ukraine. My mother was from Siberia. They came to this country and 
They didn't know much of anything, how to do anything whatsoever. I never went to preschool because they didn't even know that preschool existed. My English was not very strong when I arrived in kindergarten. I had to actually learn English. I learned it pretty well. By first grade, you know, I did not learn to read. All the other kids learned to read. I did not learn to read. By the second grade, I think I finally sort of got it down a little bit. But I was one of these kids who was always asking questions. And that was not popular with the teacher. The other thing that was happening also was that when I learned to do something, I would help other kids. I don't know if you remember, but you know, prior to 2005, all collaboration, all helping other kids, whether it was in homework or classwork, was called cheating. You're supposed to do the work yourself. You're not mm -hmm. supposed to let help somebody else do the work. So I got into a lot of trouble. By third grade, I was really in serious trouble. Los Angeles Public Schools, um, in those days, that was the 50s, 60s, corporal punishment was allowed. Teachers could hit kids with a ruler. You could hit them with a hand. You can pull them on the ear. You can do whatever. Well, mm -hmm. this teacher put me under her desk. I was under her desk because I was talking too much and I was helping the other kids and that was not allowed. So I sat under that desk, I don't know, for a couple of hours. It was unfortunate. But at that time, I said to myself as a little kid, when I grow up, I'm going to change the education system. So I have been on a mission to empower kids and to allow collaboration and to respect kids and give them an opportunity to be independent, creative thinkers since I was in third grade and put under that desk. So it hasn't, it's not religious. It's just a personal passion based on that. Through the rest of elementary school, I still was not as well-mannered as I could have been, unfortunately. But by the time I got to ninth grade, I had already figured out the system. And so I was very I, I listened to everybody. I didn't believe what they said, but I did it. And um, But I still had that in the back of my mind. I wanted to help other kids be as successful as they could be. And I saw just from my own friends and from what was going on that their spirit was crushed by the system. Their mm -hmm. creativity was gone. And anyway, my passion uh, continued. At the age of 14, I got a job at a local newspaper in a little town called Sunland Tahunga, which is just outside of La Crescenta, Los Angeles area. And I guess that was a stroke of luck because the it was a little day, weekly newspaper and they hired me because I got to do a lot of the reporting and sort of paperwork that those guys didn't want to do. And so they got, they gave me the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And I was very, I was grateful. And I didn't realize at the time is what they were teaching me were the skills, the journalism skills of how to reach other people in a journalism world. I ended up mm -hmm. uh, writing a column for teenagers. It's something called the Los Angeles Mercury News, which doesn't exist anymore. But then I went on from that to the New Los Angeles Times as just a teenage reporter writing a teenage column. So that's how it all started. Did you ever think about like think about the power of the mind, you know, because I've always said that if you're approaching something with fear or something you don't have never experienced, you know, most people think, you know, can I do this? Will I succeed? You know, am I capable of doing this? Instead of saying I can do this, I will succeed. I am capable of doing this. The difference of that positive thought process out the gate compared to the initial negative thought process. Have you thought about anything like that as far as, you know, starting off on the right foot from a mental perspective? I think it's very important to start off on a right foot from the mental perspective. You can't be afraid of failing because then you won't do it. And what I always said to my students and what I actually did in my own classes, and I, I started teaching in 1984 at Palo Alto High School. And I changed the traditional way of teaching in about 1985, about a year after I got there. And I got into a lot of trouble for that because teachers are expected to lecture and I wasn't lecturing. I do think that I said to myself, and actually my students saw it in an action, that I was going to do what I thought was right. And if I got into trouble, I would then ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. But I was never going to ask for permission to do it. And, you know, I was just passionate about the fact that I was right about the school system. I lived it. 
You lived it too, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody does. And of course, I wasn't sure that I was going to be successful. But I thought to myself, if I don't try, I, nobody else is trying. Someone has to try. Mm -hmm. And I am I am going to do this. And uh, I was also empowered by the story of this man, Varian Fry, who you probably never heard of. He was a Harvard graduate. Um, in 1941, he went over to France himself, by himself, a single person, to rescue all these Jews that were stuck in Marseille and had no way to get out. And he did it himself. He didn't. There was no team or anything. He managed to rescue about, I don't know, 3,500, 5,000. I'm not sure the number, until he was caught by the Vichy government and by the American government who said, oh my God, what are you doing? But mm -hmm. he saved the lives of all those people and he did it by himself. Eventually, it was the, there was a committee that also helped him. The And I've forgotten the name of this, the committee. It's, it's pretty well known. It's for immigrants. But, you know, a lot of people, you have to have the belief in yourself and it has to be aligned with human values. And when you align it with human values, you know, the Ten Commandments, you know, doesn't matter actually which religion you belong to because they all actually say the same thing. And mm -hmm. they all believe in treating the other people with kindness and compassion. And if what you're doing matters in to many people, then you should just keep doing it. You don't have to ask for permission to do it. You just do it. And of course, I was worried about you know, failing, but that was not the most important thing to me. Mm -hmm. What was wor what was important to me was the number of people that I was able to help. And I have thousands, thousands of students that went through that program of mine who feel empowered. And I'm trying to do that all over the world today. I'd like mm -hmm. to give all kids an opportunity to be creative and to do things that they think are important in the world that's going to make it better. I mean, it can be from, you know, planting a garden to worrying about all this fast fashion. There's so many things and I think kids today, they're so smart. You know, if if you want to know how to do something technical, if you've mm -hmm. got a kid in the house, all you have to do is ask that kid. I can tell you, they'll be able to figure it out faster than you. And so I think we need to give them an opportunity to help our world be a better place for all of us. What do you think the issue is about getting unearthing administrations? Obviously, the, these administrations and the people who are working in the administrations understand and a lot of these elements, because my wife was a teacher as well, and she said some of the same things you're saying. How do you get that admin, government, whoever it is, how do you get them to change? Because that's, you know, you got to get it changed from the foundation. You're absolutely right. You put your finger on it. The administration tells the teachers what to do. And the teachers, being honestly the most compassionate group of people out there, listen. You know, they're like, they told me what to do. They told me how to teach. They have to align to the Common Core State Standards, have to do whatever they say, and they do it. I think that the administration needs to see that the education system, as it's structured today, does not work. And the people in, who in elect members of the school board they need to put pressure on that school board and give kids more of an opportunity to think. There was an article in the New York Times just two or three days ago by David Brooks, who's a columnist for the New York Times, talking about how education is failing all of us here in the U.S. It's just, it's a disaster. I would like to see people out there t find the article and take it to their school board and say, you know, we need some change. Okay, maybe you don't want to change 100%. How about changing just 20%? How about giving kids an opportunity to have a creative, creative time in school? How about just, mm -hmm. you know, like I say, 20% of the time, it could be one day a week, it could be, you know, one hour a day, it could be some time when kids get to work on projects that they care about. And I mean, do you, do you think it's it's control? I mean, because I think I think this, I've always said the school system slows learning down. It does. You're right. It slows learning down. Why? Why does it slow it down? Because you aren't curious and interested in that. I'm sure your wife would say the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're only curious and interested when there's some relevance to the real world. And it's okay to have 
courses where you're taught things that you don't understand, as long as you have courses where you get to apply what you just learned. If you're learning how to add and subtract in a vacuum, you know, with no opportunity for an application, you're never going to want to learn to add and subtract. I can tell you that if kids are counting cookies, honestly, they're going to learn to count really fast. Whatever matters to those kids is what is going to be things that they remember. The reason Mm -hmm. I was doing journalism is because it embeds all the skills you need for the 21st century. I did not come up with the story ideas. The kids come up with their own story ideas. If they want to write about frogs, that's fine. You know, if they want to write about the best restaurants, that's fine. They get to decide as a team together with their group what they're going to be writing about. And if they don't do it right the first time, they get to revise. So grades are not an inhibiting factor. If you Mm -hmm. revise 10 times, you can still get an A, even if the person revises twice or once or whatever. Grades are also very limiting because people do what they're told to do because they're worried they won't get an A. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get an A, then they won't get in the college of their choice. It just goes on and on. So I think all kids in all classes should be given an opportunity to revise so they understand the material and don't just memorize it. If the teaching workforce is depleting, you know, so you have one way the workforce is, is pulling away from the education and you have the education pulling away from the students, how long is that going to take to have this realization? I think it's happening right now. 300,000 teachers left last year Mm -hmm. and the same number are planning to leave this year. I mean, I don't know who's going to be educating our kids Mm -hmm. at this rate. I mean, it's ridiculous. And also, if we're all going to be educated by a robot, where's the individualization coming from. I just, I think the education system needs to stop and rethink what they're doing, Mm -hmm. especially the way they're treating teachers. If you look at Finland, everyone wants to be a teacher in Finland. Why is that? Well, because teachers in Finland are respected. Mm -hmm. They're, They're not told what to do all the time. I mean, they're given an opportunity. They say, this is the curriculum. This is what the kids should know by the end of the year. You figure out how to do that. That shows respect for the teacher. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while in the U.S., you know, what they were trying to do is equalize the education, make it equal for everybody. So then what they developed was called scripted teaching. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. So textbook companies come out with a textbook. They tell you what to teach every single day of the school year, where the exercises are. Everybody gets exactly the same thing. So that if the student gets teacher A or B or C, get the same thing. Doesn't matter who, what teacher you get. That is not individualized for the classroom. Mm-hmm. That is actually goes against the creativity because not only are the kids memorizing stuff they don't understand, the teacher is too. Because mm-hmm. they might, they might, this is not a good idea, but I have to do it anyway because the administration said this is what we're doing. So I think we need to stop forcing teachers to do things that they know are not going to work in their classrooms. Well, it's kind of like uh, if you think about that in life, that pattern in life, a lot of people have different types of brain and there might be one type of brain where, all right, here's a subject and I'm just going to skim this subject because I'm not interested in this subject instead of saying, hey, I want to digest this. I want to learn this and then I can convey it the right way. There's not a lot of digestion in society. Maybe this the root of the pattern is causing that from the school system. Does that make sense? Because the way you explain that, you know, instead of just when you're trying to memorize something, if we're all trying to memorize something just to to achieve something, we're not keeping that information. It's just we're memorizing it, we get to the grade, and it's gone. Instead of looking at that information, being interested in the information, and digesting that information, and then making it your own the way you convey it. I see less of that. That, but that you're right. It's exactly that. There's this group called, um, the, it's a sport, memorization as a sport. I don't know if you've seen it, mm-hmm. but you, there's there's even a film about it. You know, kids that 
do memorization. They can memorize like up to 55 or 60 numbers in an order, specific order, Mm -hmm. which shows the capacity of the human brain to memorize nonsense because these things mean nothing to them, absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And they can memorize it. The memory lasts for, I don't know, five or 10 minutes. And after that, it's gone. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing with kids is they're doing the same thing. They're memorizing, maybe it's not numbers, but they're memorizing information that they don't understand why they're memorizing. Mm -hmm. And so literally, if you get an A on a test in a subject that you don't understand, but you just memorized, you know, you forget everything. Within two weeks, you can only remember 35%. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. You know, Mm -hmm. kids are memorizing without understanding. So there's a big difference between learning something and how to do it and just memorizing something. Well, that goes back to, you know, what we're trying, you know, we're going against the universe, you know, because we're trying to make everything linear. And it seems like that's, that's the easy way to do it in the school system. You know, and I think you could apply this to anything. If you if you really started understanding kids and, and where they come from and, and what type of personalities they have, you know, I think if you could group people based on personalities and then feed them education based on the personality, you might get a lot more bandwidth, you know, as far as better people in society. I don't know whether you can group them according to personality, because I remember, you know, when my my classes were very big, 70 kids in a class, sometimes mm-hmm. 80. And if kids ever said to me, because sometimes they would say to me, I don't want to work with Johnny. I don't like him. I need to work with whoever it was. And I would say, okay, you go home and you talk to your mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And if they tell you that they really love everyone they work with, then you come back to school tomorrow and tell me that. And if they don't love everyone they work with, then you come and tell me that. Not a single kid ever came back and told me that their parents loved all the people they worked with. How about tone? Could we identify tone? Because, you know, you know tone, I, tone attracts tone. No, but they need to learn to work with different groups, different people. And that's what I told them. I said, you know, it's for me, I was an example. I said, you know, the administration in this school doesn't really like me. You know, the kids seem to like me a lot and the parents like me. I need to learn to get along with them, whether they like me or not. You know, you need to learn to get along with people, whether you like them or not. And everybody needs to learn this trick philosophy of mine, respect. I mean, respect for the other person. You might not agree with them. Like, for example, you know, the Republicans and Democrats, they might not agree on what they're talking about. But honestly, we both have the same goal, and that is to make America as good as it can be. Mm -hmm. And if just listening to the other side shows respect, and right now we're not even listening, we need to listen and and understand where other people are coming from, no matter what their religion or ethnicity or background or skin color. And that's where all the problems come. We don't listen. We have no mm-hmm. respect. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in my classes, my students wanted to do certain things and I just maybe didn't want to do it. I, I listened to them. We talked about why it might be good or might not be good at this particular time. It was very helpful mm-hmm. for kids to learn to listen to each other. And they took those skills with them to as they as they became adults. And, you know, while my original problems with the administration, you know, in the first first, I don't know, 15 years I was there were solved when I got that award of California Teacher of the Year. All of a Mm -hmm. sudden it was like, oh, well, maybe she's not so bad after all. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, all the kids seem to like her. You know, all the parents seem to like her. So maybe this method works. Mm -hmm. And so now, of course, everyone knows it works. You know, Mm -hmm. giving kids an opportunity to, to be independent thinkers, to be respected for who they are and what they say, and to try to work together. I mean, we all live on this planet together. We all have to get along. You know, we don't have another planet to go to. I don't care what Elon Musk is saying. If he wants to go to Mars, well, he can go. But I'm not going. Mm -hmm. I kind of like Earth. If you think about that differently, right, and you think about what you structured in a group and each person in that group, understanding the different personalities within that group and identifying that there's a, a different level of 
thought process, you know, instead of making things linear, it might create a situation, your way probably creates a situation where there's the less defense mechanisms in society because you're going, instead of understanding a, a one line, you know, standard, if you've had this experience and you understand other people within a group, when you go out, go out in life, that you're going to emulate that in life. I would think you would have less defense mechanisms based on that experience as a young adult. That's absolutely right. You yeah. understand that, you know, I mean, I was just traveling to the United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. And I, so I met people from Abu Dhabi and Dubai, actually from all over the world. And, and you realize, you know, we're all the same. You know, mm -hmm. we might be wearing different clothes, speaking different languages and so forth. But everybody wants, you know, they want to be loved and respected and treated in ways that indicate that, you know, we understand they're human beings with very similar desires. And um, we need to work together with each other. Um, and we don't, you know, we need to stop labeling someone, you know, as mm -hmm. coming from this group or that group, and then they don't get along. Um, honestly, it was so great to be in Dubai and, and to see how well all these groups get along together. I mean, 90% of the population of Dubai are immigrants, 90%. And they're from all over the world and mm -hmm. they all get along. When you think, you think about that too, I mean, I mean, that's a, that's a big deal because like I said, I think we, if we have fear about something, we're going to be defensive about it. And that's right. because we may not have the information and so forth to understand a position the right way. I mean, that's a big deal. It is. It was a big deal for me too, you know, to to meet everybody, you know, to see just because they dress differently doesn't mean that they are different, you know. That mm -hmm. we they're basically we all have the same needs, and we need to take care of each other and to respect each other and to to allow people to say what their needs are and what they think and yeah. stop closing people off. I mean, I just see all these, you know, free speech. There's no free speech anymore. At the universities, you know, the right won't listen to the left and the left won't listen to the right. And, you know, people say nasty things about each other. And it's like, oh, please, let us, can we all be together? We're all human beings, you know? I mean, if you think about it, stereotypes are in, environmental. Just like I say that, you know, skin color is environmental. And, right. and I learned this myself because I grew up, I was born in North Carolina and my, my dad was from New Jersey. So I always went back and forth from the Northeast to, to the South. And the Northeast had understanding about Southerners and the Southerners had understanding about North, you know, the people in the North. But the thing is, it was just those stereotypes were created based on the environment they lived in because everybody has the same type of sensitivities. You know, and I think put a million people in a bowl compared to 100,000 people in a bowl. Things are in that million people bowl is going to be a little more perpetuated than the one with 100,000 in that bowl. We need to look at things that way. You know, I think it would make things a lot easier and simpler. I think that's true. So, I mean, I think it's true. I mean, I was in North Carolina this past summer and it's beautiful, by the way. And they do have it's different than California, but actually I loved it, you know, mm -hmm. and I loved all the people that I met there and it was a, it was a great event. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do understand what you're saying about, you know, the different culture and different parts of even the United States, you know, we all have these stereotypes that we hang on to. And I'm just wondering whether we wouldn't do ourselves a favor by getting rid of some of these stereotypes and, uh, realizing that all these people, they're all really the same and they're they're, they're great people mm -hmm. and yeah. have the same goals. They just might be trying to reach them in different ways. Different understandings. You different know, it's understandings. Just, it's just like if you have, let's say if you have an herb that grows in a part of the world and it's a very special herb and has certain health benefits. If you look at that area and look at the people from that area uh, in a hundred to say a thousand years, there's probably something there showing where this herb has benefited that culture. That's environmental. That's right? environmental. It's the same thing. It's a, I think it's the same thing across the board that, that people don't understand, which they should. Right. You know. Well, I think with the internet age that we're living in, we have the opportunity to communicate more effectively, and it would be great if we could try to understand each other using those tools instead mm -hmm. of using that to create more differences because 
I just remember growing up with the newspapers in Los Angeles, 1960s. If I wanted to know what was going on in New York and I was in California, it took at least 24 hours for me to know about it. And today, if I want to know what's going on in any part of the world, honestly, it takes three minutes on... <laughs> you know, the internet to figure it mm -hmm. out. Somebody posts it on, on any, you know, platform. There's so many platforms out there. You're on the campus at Stan uh, Stanford, you said? Yeah, I'm on Stanford campus. And what, what do you do and do currently there? So I've been working with the School of Education, and my husband is a, a emeritus professor of physics. He was chairman of the physics department at Stanford for many years. And um, I've also worked a lot with uh, the provost office, and m my goal is also to help modify the education at the university so that students are given more options to do what I was talking about earlier instead of just listening to a lecture, but act to actually interact with each other and to come out of the university four years with a degree where they actually say that they've done a lot of things, not just heard about doing a lot of things. What do you think a college degree represents today? Well, I think a college degree today, depending, of course, where you're coming from, it indicates that you have the determination to stick it out and to learn how to learn for four years, learn how to get along with other people, learn how to sort of hone your own particular interests so that you know more about yourself than you did when you started. So most of the time, kids start in college at the age of 18, and they're done by the age of 22. So hopefully you know a lot more about the world and about your particular interests, no matter what those interests might be. You know, if it's chemical engineering, whatever it is, and you have more skills to help the world be a better place. That's what I think you should be getting out of college. And well, um, hopefully they, most people do get that. Well, I mean, if you talk about your philosophy with the group setting, as this resonates, it's, it re it's resonating with me more and more. And you just talked about something that people are going to college for to, to see how other people live and, and experience other people in their space. You know, if you did this, like you're saying, then it's a better understanding. So you're just yes. enhancing that experience. So you may be coming to college with no experience based on how the system is now, right? That's Understanding correct. other personalities. That's right. It gives you an opportunity, hopefully, to work with other personalities, other ethnicities, other people from other backgrounds, and see what we all can do to make the world better for all of us. And, um, you know, there's a lot of problems in the world, as you know, we all know, and there's a lot of possible solutions. And it would be great to get these young people with their energy and their adaptability and their mindset to help us resolve some of those problems. When you think about the Amazon, most of us think about a website, but actually you should think about the Amazon forest and what's happening to that Amazon forest. Because, you know, we want our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren to have a planet where it's going to be hospitable for them to live. And we need kids to help create that and make that happen. And we can't do it ourselves here in the U.S. We need to collaborate with India and China. I mean, they have the largest populations in the world and um, Europe. And we all need to work together to get this to happen. We don't want to say that, oh, we should have done that 20 years ago. I mean, we have to do what we need to do now. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of young people are very interested in this, and we should let them explore and come up with their solutions might work. Now, somebody, if somebody wants to find information about your system and, and the books you've written and so forth, where do we, where do we find that? So the book I wrote, How to Raise Successful People, Simple Lessons for Radical Results, it's on Amazon. It's in 29 languages and um, it's in audio version and Kindle version all the different versions. So that gives you an introduction to what I'm talking about. And one of the things that I'm hoping to do is to write another book that would target teachers. In that book, I would like to try to help teachers learn to teach in my my style. So I did, I did write a book like that already, 
but it, well, it came out in 2015 called Global Moonshots in Education or just Moonshots in Education. It's an academic book. It's available on Amazon. I think it's still available on Amazon. And that was targeting just teachers. But I think I could be actually even more explicit in helping teachers in the classroom today. So that's why I'm interested in possibly writing another book, because I do think that teachers want to do this. They just are not, don't know how to do it. And perhaps, as you mentioned earlier, administrations might not support them doing this. They might mm -hmm. say, no, you've got to follow the instructions I'm giving you. And if you don't, then you'll be in trouble. Um, I think teachers, teachers are really smart and they need to be given an opportunity to voice their opinions and control the education. I think there's a lot of good information. I definitely think you're a major, major thought leader in the education space. I mean, it's, uh, I think you got it flushed out pretty good. Well, I've been very happy to be here with you and thank you for all those great questions. I'm really thrilled and I hope a lot of people will get some ideas from what I'm talking about and perhaps talk to their school boards or their teachers or whoever in their community can be an influencer. They can be an influencer too. They need to remember they too have the power to influence. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show and this has been Esther Wojcicki and I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. Mm -hmm.